All right, good morning and welcome to the Westchester Region State Legislative Forum sponsored by AARP New York. My name is John Lentz. I'm the editor-in-chief of City and State Magazine, which is partnering with AARP New York on a series of forums this summer. Issues facing seniors are always important in Albany, but the coronavirus pandemic has made them more important than ever. Today, we'll be talking about a variety of issues being addressed in the state legislature. But first, we'll hear directly from a couple of folks at AARP. Now I'd like to introduce David McNally, Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy at AARP New York. David? Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. I am David McNally, the Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy for AARP New York. I want to welcome you to the City and State Westchester Region State Legislative Forum that AARP New York is sponsoring. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us virtually in this new world in which we live. And in a few minutes, John will introduce our very special guests. These are your state assembly members and senators who represent you and your neighbors in the Westchester region. Jo John will introduce each legislature and then launch right into questions so we have as much time as possible to hear their plans, their positions, their policies on issues important to the 50 plus. I want to remind everybody that ARP is strictly nonpartisan. We do not endorse candidates. We do not give money to political parties. We do not give money to candidates. We stick to and talk about and advocate for the issues that are important to the 50 plus. And we hope this conversation today does that as well. We're all about improving the lives of the 50 plus and working on those issues to achieve that goal. If we were in a big room like we used to, <laughs> And I said, how many of you out there have a loved one in a nursing home? Or how many of you have been a family caregiver at home or have received care from home or think you're going to be a caregiver in the near future? Or how many are struggling with the high costs or access to prescription drugs? We would see a lot of hands go up. And I suspect that's true even virtually when we ask all of you those questions. And those are the priority issues of ARP that we're gonna talk about today, and hopefully we'll get to some other issues as well. But we're here to hear from your representatives about their plans or their policies or their positions or all three on prescription drug costs, on nursing home quality, on family caregiving, on economic security issues, particularly during this pandemic. So we have a lot to cover. We're all about improving the lives of the 50 plus and we'll be asking our state legislators what they're doing or plan to do about those issues. So buckle your seatbelt and get ready for a fast ride. We hope to cover a lot in the, in the time we have. I again wanna thank all of you for participating and I again wanna thank the state legislators for joining us today. I know how hectic and busy their schedules are. And with that, I wanna turn it over to Kat Fisher, who's the Associate State Director for ARP New York for the Westchester region. Kat? Actually, David, this is Maggie Castro. Kat couldn't be with us today, so I'm oh, kind I'm of sorry, pitching Maggie. since we both do I share the Maggie, region. Yeah, I am Mag Let me introduce you then. Maggie <laughs> Castro, who is the Associate State Director, shares the region with uh, Kat, but Maggie is an Associate State Director for um, a couple of boroughs in the city, as well as in Westchester and in its environment. So welcome, Maggie. It's great to see you. And thank, thank you, you David. for joining us. Thanks, David. And thanks to John and City of State. I see that there are uh, Westchester Region AARP volunteers joining us here as well. Um, and I want to note that they are key to a lot of the work that we do here, which includes, as I know, our state legislators can attest to this, uh, showing up in red shirts, making sure that our legislators are aware of uh, what's going on with AARP, what we're working on, and that are responsive to the needs of the 50 plus. So I'm sure they and all our members will be listening carefully and are anxious as we hear from our lawmakers. So with that said, I'd like to turn it back over to John to introduce our state legislators and get right into the questions. John? Great, thanks so much, Maggie, appreciate it. Um, and let me just point out again, AARP is strictly nonpartisan, so is city and state. Uh, we'll try our best to avoid political attacks during this discussion and, and stick to the policy. I'll now introduce the state lawmakers that make up our panel, all of them representing parts of Westchester County. We have State Senator Alessandro Biaggi, State Senator David Carlucci, who may be joining just a bit late here, State Senator Pete Harcum, State Senator Shelley Mayer, Assemblymember Tom Abenanti, who is simultaneously presiding over another state legislative panel, so he'll be off and on, uh, Assemblymember David Buckwald, 
and Assemblymember Sandra Galef. I'll also note that uh, two of the lawmakers, Senator Biaggi and Assemblymember Buckwald, uh, will have to leave early, so we'll give them a few uh, questions up front before they have to hop off. Uh, other lawmakers, it's a busy day in Albany, other lawmakers may be uh, coming and going, um, tending to other business as well. Uh, so we'll roll with this as best we can. Um, but our first question this morning, what proposals will you advance or support to address the high costs of prescription drugs, particularly now as a pandemic has made access to affordable prescription drugs more critical than ever? Um, Senator Biaggi, I know you have a, a short time when it let's start with you. Thank you very much, John, and thank you to City and State and AARP for holding space for this very important conversation and very timely conversation um, in our world right now. Um, so one of my key priorities, and, and good morning to everybody. My name is State Senator Alessandra Biaggi, and I represent the 34th State Senate District. So one of my top and key priorities um, that I introduced um, actually last year is called the Manufacturer Disclosure and Transparency Act. Um, and I have been working, in, in fact, very closely with AARP um, to really make sure that we can get this legislation in the right place. Um, and a shout out today to Bill Ferris, who I believe may be on. Um, this legislation originated um, as an idea with AARP, and um, the essence of it is that it essentially will require manufacturers to, disco to, excuse me, to disclose what's called pay-to-delay agreements. Um, and so what this means is that these are agreements that um, brand name drug companies enter into um, with generic manufacturers to essentially delay the availability of drug companies um, to offer more affordable alternatives. Obviously, that's an egregious thing that happens. Um, and when I learned about that, I was outraged by that, of course, which I think is the right emotion to have. Um, and the, the last piece of this bill is that um, these agreements in the bill will be required to be um, shared with the New York Attorney General's office. Um, and the purpose of that is to bring transparency um, to drug companies that are doing this, who are basically price gouging um, prescriptions for all New Yorkers. Um, many, many different patients in New York and around the country, this is not just a New York issue, uh, really do face increasing costs, but truly unacceptable costs. Um, there's a lack of transparency about how medication is priced. Um, and for a very long time, what we've seen is that pharmaceutical companies essentially operate under very lax regulations at the expense of all of us. And so this bill is, an, is a real attempt to, again, bring transparency to this industry, um, but really also to discourage these pharmaceutical companies from even engaging in these kinds of agreements. Um, under these kinds of deals, patients are forced to pay, of course, the higher named, um, the higher brand, higher name brand price, um, despite the availability of a generic drug. And last year, final thing I'll say about this bill is that according to um, the Federal Trade Commission, these deals actually are cost of Americans roughly $3.5 billion, which is an astronomical cost to the American people. And a quick follow up there, uh, Senator, any status update where that bill's at, kind of how, many, how much support it has, how many sponsors, whether the governor's um, weighed in on it? Sure. The governor has not waited on it, um, to my understanding, although there was an attempt, I believe, to place this bill in the budget. And I think many people know how I feel about putting policy that's very important um, in the budget, which is a, a very large document. And oftentimes policy can get lost in the mix there. Um, but the bill is still pending. Um, and we're going to have to work on it last, excuse me, next year. Um, obviously, you know, this year was a truncated um, legislative year. And um, the last thing I'll say is that there's 11 co-sponsors on the bill. So we're still working to get as many as possible. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, Assemblymember Abenanti, are you free to weigh in on Yes, that? I am. Uh, I, I can weigh in on that very briefly. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, uh, I know many of us are supporting, uh, I for one am supporting the New York Health Act. Uh, which would be basically uh, health care for all in New York. And my understanding of the way uh, the sponsors have drafted this, that would also include uh, pharmaceutical costs. So I, I think that's another thing that we can do in addition to the great proposal that Senator Biagi has made. Great. Thank you, Senator. Any, any other legislation you're looking at to address high prescription drug costs right now? Assemblymember Abenaki? 
Uh, no, I, I like the senator's proposal, and uh, <laughs> we'll be supporting that. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then, uh, Assemblymember Buckwald, I know you also have just about uh, 20 minutes here. If you could uh, hit on high costs of prescription drugs, what, if anything, is being done in Albany to address that? Sure. Well, uh, among things that are um, worth mentioning is actually, we actually passed a bill um, this past month, July. It has not yet been sent to the governor, but it will be before the end of the year to provide um, a demonstration program for life-saving prescriptions like insulin um, and making sure that there is uh, there are ways for people to access these life-saving medications, even if they don't have their own uh, health insurance, and also to make sure that there's access to emergency prescriptions. One of the things that we're particularly sensitive to, probably in all times, but especially uh, during this pandemic is that when a prescription is expired, but someone needs access to a uh, life-saving drug, we don't want to, we want to make sure that they have that. And so I want to credit all my colleagues uh, for having put that forward and, and making sure that's part of the discussion. A lot of the conversation about prescription drugs does emanate, first and foremost, from the federal level. Frankly, I think that the uh, uh, Medicare program and Medicaid and all the other federal uh, uh, programs should be making sure that they um, negotiate drug prices. Uh, unfortunately, when the Medicare Part D program was put in place, there was a ban on the federal government using its bargaining power to reduce costs for both uh, um, uh, Americans and taxpayers uh, from both perspectives. And I don't think that that makes any sense uh, in a well-functioning uh, marketplace. So um, I think you know a lot of the role the state will have will be on individual uh, programs, either the uh, healthcare uh, programs that the New York State itself administers, including through our um, uh, healthcare marketplace, but also making sure that we are a backstop to what I hope will be a uh, new approach uh, starting next year from the federal government actually tackling uh, these issues. I know there's been a lot of talk right now uh, out of uh, Washington and particularly the White House, but I have not seen very much action. Great, thank you, Assembly Member. Um, and we will get to the rest of the panelists briefly, but again, I know Assembly Member Buckwell and then Senator Bashi have to hop off momentarily. I wanted to jump ahead to our next question, give you a chance to weigh in, and then let you both uh, go on to your other business for today. Uh, nursing homes, uh, getting a lot of headlines lately in New York, a lot of attention to their role in the coronavirus pandemic. Over 6,500 New Yorkers have died in nursing homes from COVID-19. The governor recently signed a bill to repeal legal immunity granted to nursing homes for non-COVID related issues and only going forward, not retroactively for COVID and non-COVID related issues. Do you think this repeal should be full and retroactive? And where did you stand um, on that bill in particular? Senator Biaggi, over to you. I would be happy to talk about this. I think many of my colleagues have heard me basically bang a very large drum about this very issue. Um, listen, as lawmakers, I and, and truly as a lawmaker, um, I take my job very seriously. We all do. The number one thing um, that I am thinking about all the time, but especially when it comes to our aging New Yorkers, as well as those who live in nursing homes, um, is protecting their lives. Um, and especially um, their lives and protecting them during the most high risk moment, which was COVID-19 and the spread of it. And in what we have identified early on in the pandemic as a very vulnerable portion of the population. Um, the legislature's public hearings on residential healthcare facilities, which happened um, yesterday, excuse me, the day, month, both succeeding, um, preceding Mondays, um, there's been many hearings, so I, I apologize for that really I think have proven from the testimony that we've heard that the state essentially failed to provide all of the necessary options and the resources to protect the lives of those who lived in nursing homes. Um, as you mentioned, John, more than 6,500 New Yorkers have died in nursing homes and adult care facilities from COVID-19. And I wanna just caution and say this, 6,500 that we know of, we still do not have an accurate count of how many people who left a nursing home and went to a hospital and died there have actually died because the Department of Health, um, as well as the hospital associations um, have not provided that information yet. That's a very critical um, piece of information that will probably um, increase that number from 6,500 to probably several more thousand, if not even higher than that. Each and every single one of these deaths represents a family 
who is not only mourning, but they are just, they're looking for answers. And I've spoken to many of them and that is the number one thing that they have asked for. They wanna understand and know why. Um, unfortunately, because the Governor's Emergency Disaster Treatment Protection Act um, was slipped into the budget this year, um, these healthcare facilities have essentially been stripped of liability for the new workers in their care. Um, the, the obligation to right this wrong and to create transparency and accountability um, for the thousands of families who have lost their loved ones is and remains to be my top priority, um, especially at this very time. And listen, I understand the essence and the elements of a pandemic. Clearly, we've all now lived through one. Um, there, there are and remain to be many factors at play. Um, and I think that we can be honest about the fact, and we have to be honest about the fact that a lot of nursing homes, if not a majority of them, really did not receive the full support that they needed to make sure that people could be as safe as possible. Um, but that does not mean that we com completely strip away the provider's responsibility for the care of our loved ones. Um, this issue goes beyond COVID, and this is really where the crux of this issue also fell for me, which was that in that budget bill that I just re referenced, um, this bill also took away the rights of those New Yorkers who had gone to non-COVID related um, treatments, diagnoses, uh, providers during COVID. So let me explain what I mean by that, just to be very clear, okay? Um, if you went to the doctor for a broken arm, gave birth, had appendicitis, went to the dermatologist, your claims against your healthcare provider for anything that is um, not gross negligence, and as an attorney, I know gross negligence is a very high standard, essentially is null and void. You, can, you don't have the ability to sue your doctor if that doctor engaged in malpractice. Um, in my 17 months in office, this budget provision is truly one of the most egregious abuses of power I have ever seen. Um, not only for the reasons I just mentioned, but finally, because what has what happens in our budget process which is very much related to this bill and this immunity bill and the reason why i voted no on the rollback provisions is because it is our job as lawmakers to represent the voices of those that we represent and the budget document is the most important document it is a moral document that represents our most important priorities um the bill that we just passed to roll back some of the um, immunity provisions in the budget only addresses the COVID related cases prospectively um, and restores the protections that exist and does not, excuse me, does not restore the protections that we retroactively took away from individuals um, and their rights. So the, the long and short is this, no bill is perfect. And yet this bill, especially in the budget was, um, just went to a level that, that made me frankly uncomfortable um, and should really make all New Yorkers very uncomfortable. Um, and I'm going to continue to speak about it as much as I can because this this is just the, the, the pinnacle of what is wrong in Albany. And at this very moment in time, the fact that our most vulnerable New Yorkers would be at the crux of this is just absolutely unacceptable. John, can I jump in quickly? Certainly. I'm gonna answer your question directly. I personally believe, and I think many of my colleagues believe, there should be full repeal. The crisis is over we should go back to the normal standards for negligence and protect the people in nursing homes. But there are so many other things that have happened. I sat through the 33 hours of hearings that we had with respect to nursing homes and hospitals, and there were a lot of things that were done wrong. I compliment the governor for coming forward, taking the leadership that was missing in this country, but that doesn't mean we did everything right. We were the first ones out there. We were the pilot project. But looking back now, we've got to do things differently if there's a second round or a different time of pandemic. For example, our nursing home uh, uh, people did not have the PPEs, the personal protection equipment they needed. They didn't have the training on how to deal with people with COVID. They didn't have the ability to quarantine people. And then we excluded visitors. And many of those visitors were the family caregivers. And they were desperately needed as the eyes and ears of what was going right and what was going wrong in the nursing homes. We also needed more home care. And our system doesn't pay for home care. So that we could have taken people out of the nursing homes, gotten them home care, and given the nursing homes more room to quarantine those who were ill. There's a whole big question as to whether or not the people were moved from the hospital 
to the nursing homes prematurely? We still don't have an answer to that question. Uh, the senator pointed out that we're not getting the information that we need from the health department. I, for one, pressed the commissioner again yesterday, following up on the questions of just about every one of my colleagues in the previous weeks. And I said, commissioner, you keep saying you're gonna look at the numbers. Well, you have the numbers. When are we going to get them? And in what form are we going to discuss them? We didn't get an answer. So the legislators, legislature's role is to get the facts, make policy, and then hold the administration accountable. We're all trying to do that. My colleagues who joined, who joined in on, that, on those 33 hours of, of, of hearings were there. We heard as much as we could. We're working on the nursing home problem. Um, we're not there yet, though. I said, I'm going to quick follow up on that uh, full repeal of legal immunity. Uh, specifically, should that be retroactive or, or simply going forward in your view? Are you talking to me? Yeah. I, 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 as a lawyer, I, I find it very difficult to say to somebody, I'm going to make something that you did previously a criminal or, 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 or they, I, I don't think if we really understood the implications of that piece of legislation that was tucked into the budget, most of us, I admit, didn't even know it was there. Uh, I don't think we would have passed it the way we passed it, but we passed it. So I think we've got to find some way to compensate those people who were injured. But we have to be very careful how we do that. If you go retroactive, you're now taking conduct that somebody did in the past, and you're, and you're, and you're maybe making it criminal. I think this is a point that has to be discussed. I don't think we can just blow it off and say, it's done, it's done, and they're not going to get compensated. But I think we have to find a different way to deal with it rather than just reinstating full liability under the civil and criminal law. John, if I may, just for one moment about that, the retroactivity piece of this bill is very important to understand because it's nuanced and I want to be clear that everybody understands the piece that I'm referring to. Um, in the bill, there is a COVID and non-COVID um, aspect of immunity, right? The, the budget was passed and signed April, April 2nd passed, April 3rd signed into law. If you, as a New Yorker, went to the doctor from March 7th to April 3rd for anything, okay, had a baby, dermatologist, podiatrist, whatever, you went into the doctor thinking, I have rights. On April 3rd, that bill retroactively removed the rights of those individuals across New York State who had nothing to do with COVID treatment. That is the part of the bill that retroactively has to restore the rights to those New Yorkers because that is an outrageous abuse of power. John, John, I know this is Shelly. I know you don't want to get into a prolonged debate. Obviously, we have um, differences with among our colleagues, and I have incredible respect for Senator Biagi's passion and, and opinion on this. But um, I think our as a group. Um, we had some of these concerns about retroactivity that Assemblyman uh, Avenanti raised. I think it's a, it's a complicated issue. We do need to find better resolution. And I just think, you know, there's a, there's a wide variety of views on how best to address something that we really were not prepared for. And I think that we ought to uh, acknowledge that uh, with Senator Biagi's view, she, she feels strongly, she argued strongly. She was a fantastic advocate for that point of view and the people, particularly family members of those who had relatives who passed away, and we all share that. But with respect to the legality of the retroactivity and the scope of the uh, modifications of the immunity provisions, you know, we have differences of opinion, and, and that's as it is in any legislative body. I just want to make that clear. Certainly. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Assemblyman Buckwald, I think you have just a few minutes before you have to hop Yeah, I, I just want to provide one part of the perspective on this because when the when we passed the bill limiting uh liability on a going forward basis the sponsor of that bill said that um after the hearings that we just held uh there'd be an examination of this retroactivity issue and part of that is because it's important to get the facts one of the things and i know uh um you know this, John, when the current statistic for deaths in nursing homes is based on literally the deaths that occurred physically at the nursing home, not, for example, when someone was transferred to the hospital and then passed away uh, later, um, you know, or things that are attributable to the nursing home, as Senator uh, 
Mayor alluded to, but that maybe aren't being uh, qualified as uh, COVID uh, deaths or otherwise. And I think part of making good public policy would be having as many of those facts as possible. Unfortunately, um, the uh, Department of Health has not been as forthcoming as uh, it certainly could be. And, you know, we are grappling as legislators and, and as representatives of the people with trying to set forward a good policy but still not having all the facts. And that is a significant problem. Great, thank you, Assemblyman. And I know you and uh, Senator Biagi have to hop off momentarily. Thank you both for joining us um, and we'll move on. I appreciate also our other panelists for their patience, um, accommodating everyone so we can all get a little time to talk here. Um, but let's move on then to uh, Senator Mayer. Um, and, and I'll throw both questions at you. Um, the, the issue of high costs of prescription drugs, A, and then B, anything further you'd like to add on, on the nursing home issue, specifically that, that legal immunity question. Uh, Senator Mayor, over to you. Thank you, and thank you um, to you, John. Thank you to the AARP for being present with your red shirts all the time in Albany. You know, I say half the battle is showing up in Albany, and there's not always a voice for the people at the end of the road. And AARP is that voice. So we're very, very appreciative. I, mean, I gotta keep that up, even when we go back to in-person work. Uh, I, I'm very supportive of Senator Biagi's bill. I think we have a short-term crisis, which is uh, for me and for many of my colleagues who have thousands of their constituents on unemployment right now who lost their job in this pandemic, without that additional $600 or without the additional uh, provisions that we need from the federal government, there is a real problem, not only with prescription drugs, but with food and with housing. And we just can't close our eyes to the reality that the loss of this $600 for someone who's on unemployment is really a, a choice of prescription drugs or something else. And don't forget, you know, there's lots of people over 50 who are perhaps AARP members who are out on unemployment right now, thousands in our district, and throughout the state. So I, yes, I'm supportive of that. I, have, I am also a co-sponsor of the um, health care for all bill in the legislature. I, I agree with my colleagues, without being unduly partisan, we are hopeful that with the new Congress and particularly a new Senate, we can strengthen the coverage for all Americans so that this issue of the high cost of prescription drugs is not a barrier. That is a tremendous problem. Mm -hmm. On the nursing home and other liability, I, I think all of us have suffered watching our constituents <laughs> and loved ones either in a nursing home, in the hospital, or for reasons that they really didn't know. It could maybe be COVID, maybe not be COVID. I think there were a number of things that were not done well. I, I agree with Tom that many things the governor did very well. I think the denial of visitors in the nursing homes was a very, very serious mistake in retrospect. I think if we have rapid testing, which we absolutely must have, people should be able to go visit their loved ones. Without that, there is a real risk of people going backwards in terms of their development. So I think that's something we have to address. Uh, I did vote for the liability bill that Senator Biagi voted against. I thought it was a good first step. I think we have to re-examine the situation versus liability. But I would say when we voted for it, and I did know what was in there, we did not know what we were going into. We wanted to give medical professionals every benefit of the doubt to do their best when they weren't sure of what was the appropriate treatment. And in retrospect, I don't regret that vote, but I do think we have to revisit it. And, for, and I do think the data must be forthcoming from the Department of Health. Sure, thank you, Senator. I'll just note two things. One, uh, Senator Carlucci was unable to join due to some technical issues. Um, and we're also being joined by Assembly Member Kevin Byrne. Thanks for hopping on as well, appreciate it. Um, but Senator Mayor, I did have one follow up on, on this question of uh, retroactivity. Uh, you know, we've heard, especially from folks who are also attorneys, that there's an issue there. Um, is there ever an instance in which that uh, concern is trumped by, by the just gravity of the problem? I think you've seen this with like polluters, you know, maybe they have a certain kind of standard and, and then you go back and um, still hold them accountable. The Child Victims Act, you know, there's a certain kind of understanding that everyone was operating under, but, you know, it seems the legislature decided that was a grave enough issue. They were gonna, that you did open this, uh, this look back window. Um, uh, can you uh, specifically talk about that a little bit more? Uh, yeah, sure. 
I think of two things. One is in the context of this pandemic, where frankly, from a medical point of view, we have learned a lot in the last eight months that we didn't know, and medical professionals really yeah. did not know either. The consequences of an international pandemic are very different than some of the other examples you gave for retroactivity. There are times I support retroactivity. Uh, this is one in which I think um, doctors, nurses, and hospitals were making their best judgment overall, and their judgments were not perfect. So I don't think we can go back and uh, punitively punish them. Secondly is there's an actual tremendous dollar loss to the healthcare world during this time. They took on expenses, which they had to, and they should have, and they must. We don't want to put, I mean, I've got several hospitals in my district. I do not want to put them out of business, hospitals and nursing homes, by imposing liability for something that, frankly, they they did their best and it wasn't maybe good enough. I acknowledge that, particularly if someone you love died from a mistake. That being said, we need healthcare in our society. I don't want to lose St. John's, St. Joseph's, Montefiore, New Rochelle. These hospitals, White Plains hospitals, are really in a very risky place financially. So I think that's a factor as well. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Harkum, I uh, appreciate your patience um, I'll, I'll for both questions at you as well, the high cost of prescription drugs and the nursing home issue. Hi, John. Thank you. A, a lot has been said about, about um, both of these topics. Um, on, on the retroactivity, um, when, when you talk about the Child Victims Act, that, that was on um, a statute of limitations versus going back and lifting a protection from liability. So I, I think they're different things. Um, I, I agree with, with, with Senator Mayer that, that we found a compromise. You know, retroactivity was a tough legal concept to grapple with, to tell somebody you're free from this liability, do what you need to do to save lives, but we're learning. And moving forward, we've, we've removed that protection of non-COVID uh, liability. And I think the important point for all of this um, for, for the liability issue, for lessons learned. This is about lessons learned. You know, there's a time and place for the gotcha, but we are grappling um, with a pandemic that we have, the world has not seen since 1918. So the important thing is to learn lessons because God forbid it comes back. New York is in an excellent place right now, but as we see around the country, uh, the disease is continues to spread, it comes closer to New York, and God forbid it comes back to New York uh, in the next few months. So we want, it, we want to learn those lessons. As far as the high cost of drugs, one of the things that Assemblyman Buckwald mentioned in that bill is a cap on, on insulin expenses. So things like that that we can do. We also have um, the, uh, the Prescription Importation Task Force, that commission uh, made up of stakeholders to look at these importation issues. I'm also a co-sponsor of Senator Biagi's bill, which is an excellent bill. But I think all of these issues, you go back to what Senator Mayer said about unemployment, over 3 million Americans aged 55 to 70 have lost their jobs since March. Um, what is the impact on their insurance? What is the impact on their rent, on their mortgage, on their housing? You know, we've done six food drives because of uh, the food insecurity in our district. Uh, we did one with jointly with, with Senator Mayer because the local food pantries have not been able to keep up with demand. So we can talk about the state response as well, but we have a $14 billion deficit right now, and we desperately need help from the federal government, both in terms of continuing that $600 uh, for people on unemployment um, and then is to fill the gap so we can continue to provide the services to seniors and other New Yorkers. And uh, Senator, a quick follow up that, that insulin piece that, that <laughs> frightened to me, the, why single out that one uh, medication, that one treatment um, um, with a cap? Uh, should we be capping more things? Um, we we need to consider it, but what we were seeing was price gouging when it came to insulin. And if someone's on a fixed income, uh, if somebody's insurance is not covering all of it, so the copay we had to, we decided to cap because we did see price gouging in the marketplace. Great, thank you, Senator. Uh, Assembly Member Galas, uh, over to you again. Appreciate your patience um, yeah. on both issues here. Uh, 
drug costs in nursing homes. Um, I just want to compliment AARP. Again, I miss having those red shirts around. And I miss being in the Capitol and uh, having everybody sit behind me in the Health Committee uh, to um, talk about the issues. Or actually, they're just there with their expression on their shirt of what the bills are that they're supporting, So, <laughs> which is great. Uh, <clears throat> let me just tell you that on the prescription, I think most things have been said. but. Um, and, I, and I support them. Um, I, I think we also on a federal level have to deal with the Canada um, issue of, of getting um, prescription drugs at a lower price. That's really important. I know some of my constituents figure out ways to do that. Um, I'm also very concerned about the mail and getting prescriptions through the mail and having your um, prescription drugs there on time. I think that's a real dilemma given our mail service. Um, and I, you know, I'm a real supporter of our local pharmacies. And I think if they can provide, um, you know, good cost-effective um, service to the community, um, that's, that's a better place because they really know what's happening with the whole individual and all the medications that they're taking. And, you know, they, they're very, very helpful. Um, and then the question of nursing homes, I actually, um, I had my mom in a nursing home. I, know what that was about, not during this period of time, but I have a loved one in assisted living right now. So um, I'm, I'm really going through all this. I was one of those visitors that was probably there on, I don't know, March 8th or whenever it was that we started to close down. And, um, and I've been going through it as, as um, you know, a, 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 um, <clears throat> a somewhat family member. And what's happened with the nursing homes, I mean, I mean, going forward, I mean, you can go back and you can find out what all the liabilities are and so on, but nobody knew that this was happening. I was visiting, I wasn't tested. I don't know whether I could have brought, I found out my grandson had had COVID. I, you know, I could have, have had that and I didn't know that. Uh, but no visitors, um, you know, have come since then. I've done visits through uh, a window, um, and I'm sure other people have figured out other things. But the nursing homes, as we go forward, we have to uh, we have to look at how much it's costing in nursing homes and assisted living. It's a huge cost because, uh, as Tom said, the PPE uh, they didn't have that right away. They could not. They called my office, all of them, saying. I don't know where we get the equipment. I don't know where we get the masks. I don't know where we get the sanitizers. You know, they just didn't have them. And, um, you know, I believe most of them have it now, but there's still that issue. There's also the issue of testing all of their employees. You know, when it was two times a week, that was so burdensome. And the problem was the test didn't come back in time to be able to identify whether you had COVID before you were getting the next test. And um, I don't think we're ready for rapid testing. I wish we were, but, but it sounds like it's 50% valid, 50% not. So I don't know whether you know, we can really go in that direction at this point until the medical community, the scientific community has figured out a better testing system. Um, but you know, we, we, we've lost people within the nursing home, not just the uh, patients there, but we, the staff. Uh, the staff get sick and they go. And then you don't have enough staff in the place uh, to be able to go forward. And, um, and it's hard enough to get AIDS in the first place. Um, you know, their salaries are so low and they're putting their, their health on the line. You know, it's really a mess. I have been fighting my, my newest fight uh, because of so many of my constituents have called me about not visiting um, their loved ones. And people are losing their capabilities in a nursing home being isolated. One of your questions about isolation. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of people being isolated in these nursing homes. And so we, we've got to get to garden visits. It's going to get cold and it's going to be snowing and we may have a second round. We have got to allow some kind of a garden visit one-on-one -on -one with masks, social distancing, outdoors, um, we have to let that go, even though there is a COVID patient, maybe in the nursing home. The 28 day cycle just means we have another month when people can't visit. And that's something that we really have to do a little compromise on. Thank you.
Great, thank you, Senator. I'll note uh, Senator Mayor has to hop off to join our Senate Labor here. Uh, Senator Mayor, appreciate your time. Um, we'll see you next time. Um, and then Assemblymember Kevin Byrne, I, I think, has joined us. Are you on? Um, if you turn on your video and audio, we'll, we'll throw a question over to you, Assemblymember Byrne. Hi there. So, I, so uh, my assembly tablet burned out, um, government software, I guess, but uh, I am dealing with my cell phone and my personal laptop with that same legislative hearing you just referenced for the Department of Labor. So both very, very important issues because anyone that was dealing with unemployment knows that uh, the Department of Labor has a very big uh, part in that. So um, I'm happy to be here and uh, I'm not sure exactly what was said before, um, if there's specific questions I can help uh, provide answers to, I'll do my best. Um, but I did hear some commentary about the 32, 33 plus hours of uh, testimony we went through the past several days on the health committee. I am the ranking member on the assembly health committee. Uh, before that, I was the ranking member on the aging committee during my first term. And uh, certainly there's plenty of room for improvement. Um, I would credit the governor early on in, in the pandemic uh, for being a really effective communicator. Um, I certainly don't agree with everything, but I think there's a, there's a time to research, investigate, find out what we did right, what we did wrong, what we can improve. Um, and you don't want to do that right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, the virus hasn't gone away. We're still living under very uh, steep restrictions, but I think certainly now with the infection rate lower, this is the right time to try to get those answers, to try to find out what we can do better uh, to better prepare for a second wave should that come, uh, and, and all likely it probably will. And I think that's what those hearings were about. So we heard a lot about uh, the Department of Health. We've heard a lot from, uh, quite frankly, families uh, who lost loved ones in nursing facilities, even residents in nursing homes. And uh, it's all very, very powerful uh, testimony because I, I'm a big believer that it's, it's statements like that, it's stories like that, that helps craft better policy, that moves lawmakers uh, into making changes. Um, I know there's uh, been a lot of concerns about access to residents in nursing facilities. I think that's obviously something that's a, uh, very, import uh, very important to uh, the elderly in our area uh, who want to, uh, you know, they don't wanna be uh, isolated. Uh, in many cases, in adult care facilities, you know, it's, it's that daily communication with their loved ones that helps them. Um, and so many of them have been deprived of that. I, I would say that happened also to some members of our disabled community too. Um, and we need to find ways to do better. We learned a lot about this virus from the beginning. Um, so much has changed. And uh, again, you know, the word unprecedented is used a lot, but it, and if we, could, we could date back to the 1918, uh, you know, the pandemic. The, uh, the reality is, sorry, I'm just getting another call. This is not, this is the problem with doing this is on a cell phone. Be there? Okay, sorry about that. Um, the reality is, I don't believe any of us, that was during our lifetime. I know I'm one of the younger members, but still, um, this is for us. It's uh, really unprecedented. But we better, but we've learned a lot. So I'll, uh, I'll open it up to any questions you have. I think there were some questions about the liability legislation that was in the budget this past year. Yeah, uh, the, the legal immunity and, and the legislation, the recent legislation that uh, changed that going forward. You have a position on that. And then we've also asked everyone about the high cost of prescription drugs. Is there any legislation you support specifically to address that issue? Assemblymember. Sure. So uh, I guess first with the, the, the liability uh, protections that was, that was put in the budget, uh, there was a legislative fix that uh, I supported, but I believe it was already discussed, I'm sure it was, that it was prospective, not retroactive. Um, I spoke on the floor when we debated this, and again, I ultimately supported it. I think it was a good bill, um, but I don't think it was necessarily a surprise or it was um, in the budget um, and was misinterpreted as something else. I think people that put it in there knew exactly what it was. Um, Again, we were looking at overwhelming or potentially overwhelming our, our hospital system and healthcare system and wanted to give uh, those healthcare workers that added layer of protection. Um, whether they were working on COVID patients or working on someone, quite frankly, who had a heart attack and they were trying to provide life saving care in a hospital setting for them too, 
Um, I think if you overwhelm the hospital system, it's not just about COVID patients, it's, it's about all patients um, because you're limiting, you, you don't have enough beds. Um, and that's that very, very scary situation that the governor talked about in his daily briefings that fortunately uh, we never got to that point. I believe in certain areas of this state, we got very close to that. Uh, if you talk to colleagues in the, the New York City area or the Bronx, I think they would probably tell you, you know, visit some of those hospitals and they were very, very stressed. Um, I think we all saw news reports of, you know, that, that it's very, very grim and morbid look of, um, you know, basically tractor trailers acting as refrigerators for bodies. And it's, it's just a very, very sad and powerful uh, thing to look at. So uh, I, I thought prospectively it was the way to go um, making that change. Uh, I know there's some discussion from my colleagues. I think like, well, I'm not trying to put words in anyone's mouth, but as somebody member Ron Kim has been very outspoken about this, about trying to get some sort of retroactive protection. Uh, I, I think that is, that's something that I would caution against only because while I understand people want to go that route, I don't think this was a mistake when it was put in the budget. And uh, it's very difficult to change things retroactively um, when people acted under the, the law in that present time. And this was an argument that was used against the Child's Victim Act uh, in the past. Um, it is a separate issue. It, I know there's probably uh, comparisons that are made. Uh, I've, I supported the Child Victims Act. I supported the extension of the Child Victims Act, um, but it is different. You're dealing with healthcare and life-saving tre treatment here um, with a with an unknown virus that we're learning about constantly. It's 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 not the same thing as dealing with people who were um, sexually abused um, years ago and there was cover-ups. I, I I just think there's a distinct difference between the two. Um, as far as prescription drugs. Um, I think there's always ways that we can uh, try to uh, improve the market by um, in encouraging uh, more uh, drugs to, to come to market. I want, I want to, I'm a big believer in options uh, for patients and consumers. Um, the state has been effective, I believe in the past, utilizing things like the Drug Util Utilization Review Board uh, or Medicaid to try to leverage costs to, to bring them down. Uh, I understand in the, I believe it's in this past budget, um, and this was one of the governor's proposals to try to cap uh, the prices for insulin. Um, so we have been effective uh, in that, but I, I am always, um, I do have this, this caveat, and I know this is something that probably the big pharmaceutical companies throw out there, um, and it, it, but it's something that I don't think should be ignored. Uh, I, I don't want to limit investment in research and development because I do want uh, dollars to be invested rightfully so to development of new medicines to have to ensure that there's access for people that need it. Uh, in the case, insulin's a perfect example. People live. It is, it is not, this is not some like high, you know, brand drug. You need it to live. You need food to live. Uh, I think one of the topics that was shared with me uh, for this forum was even food. I mean, you know, if you talk to my legislators or, or, or my colleagues, it's, it's quite common that we do food drives around Thanksgiving. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. But we're doing them all the time right now. And that's because we're trying to help. But it's, it's not actually like, I'm not happy that we have to do it. It's because people need food. Um, it's kind of a, it, it, it's, it's not a pleasant thing that we know people aren't able to work and they need food. Um, but that's something that they need. Insulin is, is similar. I hope I that was able to answer your questions. And it was a long, it was a long answer. <laughs> Certainly, no, I appreciate it. Um, I do want to go now to an audience question. We have a representative of the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, John, before you do that, can I jump in? Certainly, someone. Yep. I think uh, my colleague, um, uh, uh, Kevin uh, uh, Byrne, just raised an issue that we really need to address. It's not just about um, uh, pre prescription drugs and medicines and things like that. The daily activities of people have been dramatically affected uh, by the COVID situation, by the COVID pandemic. Uh, we're talking, for example, as Kevin said, people need food. And we've recognized that there's been a strain on our food banks. And Senator Harkum and I uh, teamed up 
And we just passed some legislation we're hoping the governor is going to deal with soon, um, which uh, would uh, encourage and incentivize uh, um, uh, large supermarkets to set up uh, relationships with food banks to get more food out there. It's really sad, but in a place like Westchester County, which has so much, uh, we still have food insecurity. Or if you ask the kid who's going to school hungry, it's hunger. It's not just food insecurity. And, and so there's so many other factors that affect uh, what's going on in our community, the lifestyle of, of senior citizens. It's sad to hear about our seniors who just don't have enough money for food. I appreciate Kevin's raising that issue, and I think it's something that we all have to concentrate on. The day-to-day -day activities of people have been made more difficult because of COVID, and it's exposed what was below the surface before. Uh, I have school districts, which are seen as wealthy school districts, um, but some of the parents discovered that other kids were going to school hungry and were, didn't have lunch. Uh, these, are school, these are kids who did not qualify for free lunch, who were not, quote, poor enough. So the parents themselves got together and formed a little community organization so their kids take two lunches to school every day. And they give them to somebody at the school and the teachers then, you know, quietly distribute them to the kids who need them. Um, it's, it's, it, food insecurity is a real problem, even in Westchester County. I know the Senator, I don't know if he wants to jump in and say something, but he's been running, he's been doing all kinds of great things out there, uh, you know, collecting food, distributing food. Um, and, and that's something I think we, we need to, uh, to, re to recognize as well. Thank you, Senator. Oh, good then to a, an audience question. Uh, what, how can you use your influence as state lawmakers to ensure that all long-term care facilities have access to rapid testing supplies they need in order to safely allow residents to have ongoing in-person visits from their loved ones? Uh, Assemblymember Galef, I believe you actually talked about uh, testing earlier. Let's start with you. Um, I, <coughs> unfortunately, I think it's within the scientific community, the health community, to get the rapid tests. I think we saw very clearly um, what happened with the Ohio governor. Um, and that is, you know, is a problem. And until we have tests that, because otherwise you're allowing people to go in that maybe um, have tested for COVID inside the facility. So I'm going back to let's let's use the outdoors that we have right now. We only have it for a few more months and try to get people to come and visit everybody outdoors. And it's great for the residents to be outside. And many of the facilities have a garden of some sort. They've got a place for people to go. You can socially distance. You don't have to worry about whether somebody's had a test or not. You will be far apart. You're not going to be able to hug each other, but I think that's the direction we go until we we are assured that these rapid tests are really working. Otherwise, we're putting people in jeopardy. Sure. I'd like to join in on that if I can. Sure. Uh, I think uh, Sandy's 100% correct. Uh, I, I am really distraught over the uh, the governor's uh, failure to recognize the need for the personal contact. Uh, for those in nursing homes and those in, in assisted living facilities and those in facilities for people with disabilities. Uh, we have a whole series of, uh, of, of, of group homes, uh, of uh, uh, schools, uh, residential schools, um, and, and in, in rehabilitation centers. The, the families are vital to the, uh, the mental health of, of people in all of these facilities. You know, I find it odd that a nursing home worker um, can spend the day in a nursing home um, as a worker, but if his or her mother is in a different nursing home, he or she cannot go visit the mother. So why is it that the person who is qualified to be a nursing home worker um, and is allowed into a nursing home for, you know, 10 hours at a time, uh, can't go to another nursing home or to a, an assisted living facility or somewhere else to visit a relative. 
It just makes absolutely no sense. In fact, if they work in a nursing home where their own relative is, is, is uh, living, they can't go back in their off hours to visit. I mean, it just makes absolutely no sense. We really have to revisit this policy. And that is a motivation for, as, as the, the assemblywoman said, to get uh, this, this rapid testing. Uh, I don't understand why we're not there yet. Uh, it is a science question, but I think the real issue is, is, is that Washington is the stumbling block. To get some of these things done, we've got to get the Trump administration to stand behind the science, to say, we need this. This is not a hoax. There, this is a real problem, and we need to help the scientists solve the problem. It's not enough to give a billion dollars for somebody to go out there and research and, and try to find a vaccine. That's all well and good, but we have to wait for that. In the meantime, we've got to be doing all of these other things. We've got to get the tests out on the street. We've got to, we've got to live with this for a while. We can't all just sit back in our, in our homes and say, you know, we're, we're, this isn't, we're, we're going to wait. No, we can't wait. We've got to live our lives. We've got to get as close to normal as we possibly can. I mean, this kind of thing, you know, I know San, uh, 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 Senator uh, Mayer just left. I see she showed up at the other hearing. I, I know Kevin Byrne was trying to do it. I was lucky enough to have two computers. I have one down here where I'm watching the, I'm, I'm participating in the labor um, hearing that is going on where we're talking about many of the issues that we're talking about right here. Um, and I'm also getting you on another computer. Amazing. If we can do this, if I can participate in two meetings at once, why can't we have an instant test? It seems to me that we should be able to do that. We have pregnancy tests. We have all kinds of other instant tests. Why can't we have a, an instant COVID test that, that will at least give us some indication of whether a person is safe or not? So, Senator, yeah, Senator Harkum, uh, if you could weigh in, and um, I guess we, we've heard, you know, the, this is partly uh, up to the scientific community. Is it also not uh, something where the Trump administration could uh, direct industry, direct manufacturers, uh, medical facilities to ramp up production so we can do rapid tests, so we can uh, get where we uh, want to be? I, I think it's, um, and, and thank you, John, I, I think it's really still R&D at this point. It's not necessarily ramping up production because as, as Assemblywoman Galef said, the tests are not accurate yet. Um, so, you know, with throwing politics aside, you know, the federal government has failed from the beginning on testing. Um, but having said that, um, we do need a rapid test because even the current testing we have, there is now a backlog because there are so many that the labs are having problems processing them. So if you want to test people once a week, but you don't get the results back for 10 days, that's kind of defeating the purpose. The other is, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on, well, let's take temperatures when people come to a facility. Um, that only can catch symptomatic people. We know that there are asymptomatic spreaders. So, so that's an issue. Um, you know, I, I have a 92 year old mother who I saw last weekend for the first time since March. Um, so, you know, I know, I know the impact it has on families and the separation. So whether, whether it's, it's our, our senior centers, our long-term care centers, as Tom was mentioning, OPWDD, our, our, our mental health, behavioral health, substance use disorder treatment, you know, we've got to find ways to get that personal touch. But again, are we getting them enough PPE. You know, my office, like, like Assemblywoman Galus, we got a lot of calls from nursing homes and, and first responders saying we don't have enough PPE. So all of these are the lessons that we need to learn moving forward. Um, so if this thing comes back, we are better prepared. You know, if, if nursing homes really have the PPE they need, they now have the guidance about how to isolate patients you know, going back to the whole issue about morbidity in nursing homes, um, you know, we, we got calls in our office very early on from constituents who were concerned. Uh, their, their parents were in facilities and they knew people who had been treated for coronavirus were being returned to those facilities. So, you know, we need to learn all of these lessons so the next time we're better prepared 
and, and we can find ways to have that human contact, which is, is so vital for our senior population, for our population of folks with disabilities, and for our folks um, who are receiving treatment for behavioral health in a congregant care setting. So thank you, Senator. I do want to ask at least one more question. We heard from a similar member, Abinanti, about uh, food issues, food shortages. I, do, I want to talk about shelter as well. Um, there have been some efforts to help people afford housing costs during the crisis, but some of these initiatives will expire. Will you advance or support new or additional proposals to further protect people from losing their homes or affording their rent? Uh, and uh, some of them are Abenanti, if you're free. Yeah, I'm here. Um, well, as you know, uh, both houses of the legislature did get together on, on some of these uh, measures. Um, we did pass legislation to, um, to continue the moratorium on evictions. We passed legislation which, which gave a forbearance period for people who had mortgages. Um, both of those were quite limited. We also passed legislation because we realized that if people aren't paying rent, then the owners of the buildings, and they're not all big, huge, you know, LaFrax. Some of them are two-family homes, three-family homes, particularly in my district, in, in, in Senator's district, in San Diego, and Assemblywoman Galef's district. We have a lot of housing that is owned uh, in, you know, two, three, four families. So we also set up a fund uh, of $100 million um, for the... Uh, the, the direct payment to the owners of the apartments for those tenants who have been adversely affected and can't pay their rent. Um, but we're really, we really haven't figured out the answer to this problem. We still, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we, we, I, I think the answer, <coughs> excuse me, is a permanent program of rent subsidies because this is not just a problem during the COVID period. Like so many other uh, issues, COVID has exposed the fractures in our society. <clears throat> we have so many people who really need public housing or um, a supplement to the Section 8 program that the federal government uh, set up. Section 8 is a program which uh, provides a, a voucher for people who have incomes below a certain level. And uh, in my experience in the past, I was a, a town councilman, a county legislator, now an, <coughs> excuse me, now an assembly member. Uh, I've seen the needs for more Section 8 housing. Uh, in my past experience, I was also counsel to the Greenberg Housing Authority. And I saw how we did not have enough Section 8 certificates for people how the list of people was a mile long and the number of vouchers that would come available was it was it was an inch thick. Uh, so we really need to address uh, some of these other problems in society. Uh, and this particularly hurts senior citizens because many of our senior citizens don't have family to rely on or don't want to rely on their family. They've long ago stopped working. Their pensions and their social security go, don't go very far at all in Westchester County. Many have retired a long time ago, so their pensions are very low, and Social Security is not keeping up with what's going on. So we really have the COVID situation, pandemic, highlighting what was going on before. It's now just, you know, uh, it, it, we're now seeing it on steroids. Uh, I think it's an issue we have to deal with, I, but frankly, I don't know that we have an answer, a, a complete answer. We've tried. We've worked together, both houses have worked together very well um, with the change of the majorities. Um, and, you know, we've tried to address these issues, but I don't, I don't think we've solved them yet. I mean, if you, we listen to our constituents, the, the problems are not yet solved. One, one of the, just let me add one more thing to this, and that is trying to get money into people's hands. Um, so we have um, unemployment insurance. We have a federal unemployment insurance plan. Uh, that is um, uh, that is that is expired. Uh, that's what the other <laughs> hearing is about. 
how can we get money into the pockets of people so that they can afford to pay rent and that they can afford to pay their mortgages. Um, but the federal government, I think, is letting us down. The federal government is the only government, not town, not village, not city, not county, not state. The federal government is the only government that can literally and figuratively print money and supply money with, they don't have to balance their budget. I realize that we're running up a big tab down in Washington, but now is the time our people need the help. So we're hoping that the feds come through and provide some more money uh, where the state just can't afford to do it. Great, thank you, Senator. And, uh, Senator Kevin, Kevin Byrne, I wanted to hear from you. Just trying to mute the other, other laptop there. Um, thank you. To answer the question as far as housing, I mean, I think the simple answer, which I don't think it, most people will accept is we got to kick this virus's butt and let people go back to work and return to some sort of uh, normalcy. And I think that's what that needs to be done. And I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate answer, right? The sooner we can get through this, the sooner uh, we'll be able to, to get people back to some uh, semblance of normalcy. One of the issues um, that uh, my colleague pointed out is, is definitely the property owners. And I know a lot of times we talk about landowners and it's this like the stigma, like the slumlord. Um, but, you know, many of them in my district, it is a small mom and pop, you know, type of uh, operation and they're property owners. And if they don't get the revenue, then the local municipality is how are they going to pay their taxes? I mean, there's, it, it's, it, it's kind of a chain reaction. So it's, it is more complicated than just subsidizing one thing directly. Um, but ultimately, obviously, we want to get people to work. I will, I will say um, that. Uh, you know, just personally in the village of Brewster that I represent, the town of Southeast, we have some good examples of affordable housing for seniors. I volunteered for one of them uh, years ago before my time in the assembly is taking care of, of the building. Um, I believe it was the Putnam Community Foundation, now it's the Brewster uh, Community Foundation, but they afford, they provide affordable housing for a lot of seniors. And uh, I think that's been a good example of, uh, you know, providing some sort of access to affordable housing for seniors. And quite frankly, if you go through the village, it is, it is, it is a beautiful building. Um, it adds value to that community. So I think it's a, I think it's a policies. And uh, I know you weren't asking this, but I jumped in later. Um, as far as nursing homes go, just to dial back a little bit. Um, obviously there's a lot of controversy over certain orders that came from the health department and there was controversy over reports that were released from the health department. And, you know, I'm, I've already been very outspoken. I don't want to make this call about that. But uh, those legislative hearings, I think, were very important because they held value for the people that want to share their stories. And it's important because just having an agency or a state department do its own investigation, I think most people would think that's like, well, what are you, you're investigating yourself. What are you going to find out? The beauty of having a legislative hearing is you get to hear people ask questions from both sides, both political perspectives, ideologies, and a wide array of uh, perspectives. And we did hear that. Um, there were people that reached out that sadly were not able to provide testimony. So I'm going to be working with my conference to host an additional forum on Monday. Um, just for folks uh, that weren't able to share their stories. And it includes folks like uh, a gentleman from, you know, a community I grew up in in Putnam Valley who lost his father uh, from COVID-19 in, in an adult care facility. And I think there's just a lot of powerful stories like that that help us as legislators uh, do a better job. So I, I wanted to mention that as well. Great, thank you, Shalman. I wanted to give a quick follow-up back on the housing issue, though. Um, Assemblyman Abenanti was saying, look, we really need help from the federal government. Um, we've heard from members of the audience, you know, what can we do to pressure the federal government to bail out uh, state government, uh, local municipalities? Maybe we need federal dollars to deal with the housing issue. Uh, what are your thoughts on that front, um, Assemblyman Byrne? Sure. I think we have a very uh, strong delegation in Washington uh, from both parties and uh, even in, in the House of Representatives where Republicans, uh, let's put it out very blankly, are in the minority. You still have the person in the White House is a Republican, so they still have 
uh, powerful leverage. And then we have the Democrat conference that's in the majority. So I think there's leverage from both sides in our delegation. I hope, I would wish we had more members. And sadly, every 10 years, we continue to lose a few members of our delegation, which is not a good thing. Um, and that, that limits our clout down there. But I think they've done a no notable job. I would say, uh, I think the federal government has admitted that you know there's a need to, to support uh, states to some extent with federal funding. I know this has been a bit of a, it's turned into a political issue with the governor and the president. Um, but what I would say is those dollars need to go to those who are affected with the coronavirus. And it needs to be very clear that it, it shouldn't be, quote, a bailout for some of our state's previous fiscal mismanagement. And I think that is I think, a line that needs to be very clear. And uh, for those, those who are adversely affected because of uh, the coronavirus, because they've been forced to not work, or they've been forced to not be able to have income to pay their rent. I mean, those are real, those are things that the government forced them to do. It's not because of a decision that they made on their own. And, uh, you know, the, if the government's forcing them to do that, then the government needs to come up with a solution. All right, we'll hear from two more panelists, and then I think we'll be out of time. I similarly remember Galef, uh, if you want to follow up on any of that, and also specifically the broader question of housing in this environment. Well, I was thinking about the housing, and <clears throat> I'm going to go back to nursing homes for a little bit, because we just had a nursing home in Osne, Victoria, a home. Uh, closing. They've been in existence for over a hundred years and provide absolutely wonderful, wonderful service to, to the elderly. But they're closing. Now, we don't really know why, but part of it probably is the cost of doing business right now for nursing homes. And I'm really concerned that we're going to lose nursing home slots for senior citizens so that they will have fewer places, fewer options to go, which may mean that more people, and, and I've, I've met some people who have moved into a nursing home during this COVID situation. I can't imagine doing that, moving in, having no contact with your family, being set up. Your family hasn't even set up your apartment or whatever else. Um, you just moved in. So it could be that more people are going to be, elderly people are going to be staying home. So we need to provide more services to families to be able to care for the elderly patient that might not be in a nursing home, but be home. So that's one thing. Um, I also um, just recently, what well, was in the paper today, that a lot of the developers that were coming to Westchester to develop high-end housing, maybe we can convince them to build some affordable housing for seniors because they're finding now they just don't have the clientele for the high-end, but they certainly have the clientele for a senior facility or a, a middle-income facility. So that might be helpful. I'm also watching the STAR program, Enhanced STAR program for our seniors. That is a key program to keep people in their housing and the governor has you know year after year tries to amend it change it uh deprogram it so that's something we really have to watch and kevin mentioned the census and how important it is that we get all of all of our seniors that are watching today or whatever organizations to be sure to fill out the census form because that's more federal dollars coming back and that's federal dollars for construction and so on. And of course, on a federal level, construction can help with constructing housing, which is important. And just to pick up on um, needing money from our state as the first state to have the uh, horrendous problem with COVID-19, we are now finding it's not just blue states anymore. It's all states are having this kind, almost all states are having this kind of problem. So I am hoping that the federal government comes to a conclusion that they have to help everybody, whether it's Florida, Georgia, Texas, or New York, we all have increased cost um, with all of the COVID testing, with all of the, you know, not everybody has a rail system like we do in, in New York City, but, you know, the cost of cleaning everything, cleaning our schools, um, it, it's horrendous. So we have to rely on the federal government to help us through this, this whole epidemic. Great, thank you. And Senator Harkum, uh, we'll give you the last word on the panel. <laughs> Sure. Thank you, John. And we'll just want to take a moment to thank AARP and city and state for putting this great conversation together. 
Um, I have a few things to say on the housing issue as someone who comes out of the affordable housing world. Uh, before I was in government, I was head of a small nonprofit uh, that built and managed affordable housing um, and proud to work with AARP when I was a county legislator on adaptability on, in public housing that said that 50% of any affordable housing built with county funding needed to be adaptable to be accessible. Grab bars, things like that. You didn't have to install them, but you already had to have the bracing in the bathroom, wider doors. Um, it was an important law. And affordable housing, the creation thereof, life cycle housing, we have an acute shortage of. For our young people returning, for the people, our workforce and our, our first responders, and particularly our seniors. You know, people may have a three and four bedroom house. They're now empty nesters. They don't want the upkeep. They don't want the high taxes associated with that. They want to stay in their local community that they help build and love. And yet there's not enough affordable housing options for seniors. And yet when you talk about affordable housing, you know, that's when the NIMBY crowd comes up. So we, we need to do a lot of education on what affordable housing is. Um, and, and that's our seniors, that's our kids, that's our workforce. Um, we've done a couple other things. Um, we, at least in the Senate, we voted to increase uh, the senior um, uh, property tax exemption to $50,000. And we've also done some work on mortgage, uh, reverse mortgages. Uh, number one, we found that there, these are two Kevin Thomas bills, Senator Kevin Thomas, we found uh, a lot of deception in terms of products and advertising and fees, and we put restrictions on that. We also voted for a bill that would make it much tougher uh, for the foreclosure process to move forward in reverse mortgages. You know, reverse mortgages can be a great um, program to keep seniors in their homes, uh, but, but like a lot of things in the financial world, there are some bad actors and we need to rein those folks in. So, this was a wide ranging discussion today from healthcare to prescriptions, to nursing homes, to housing. Um, one of the other things I wanna say very quickly is um, on long-term care. We're talking about housing and keeping people in their homes. Uh, I have two bills on that. Number one, um, where, where assembly member Byrne and I represent, it's very hard to get home healthcare workers up there because there's some rural areas. There's not much mass transportation. Right across the border in Connecticut, there's a glut of folks, and yet there's no uh, reciprocity on the licensing. So we have a bill that would address that, and the other has to do with parity of telemed, that if providers can bill the same for telemed that they can for an in-office visit, that's less of the copay and less of the cost being put on the senior and our, our folks who have mobility issues so, so that is a key thing, two key things to help folks stay in their homes. And, and with that, I just wanna thank everybody for a great panel and, and thanks for including me. Yes, thank you, Senator. Thank you to all our panelists, a great discussion. I know I learned a lot. Um, we are almost out of time, but a few final notes. On Thursday, August 12th at 10 a.m., we will host our next and final virtual conference with AARP New York, this one featuring state lawmakers from Brooklyn. And on Tuesday, August 18th at 1 p.m., City and State will host its annual virtual education summit. We'll bring back Senator Shelley Mayer and other top officials from around the state on education. Uh, now, finally, back over to David McNally of AARP New York to conclude the program. And uh, you'll need to unmute yourself. Thank you, John, and thank you to City and State for hosting or for moderating today's Westchester Regional State Legislative Forum. Uh, this, uh, John mentioned our upcoming one in Brooklyn as being the last. It will be the last in this series, but I can assure our members from around the state and those here locally in Westchester and environments, we will be doing these for as long as we can't be together in person. So uh, I look forward to uh, more of these, uh, particularly this one. Uh, I suspect after election day, we'll, we'll circle back around and want to talk to our Westchester County legislators and have them have a chance to talk about how they see the next session uh, rolling out. So look, we look forward to that. I also wanna thank our legislators, uh, the state assembly members and senators for taking time out of their busy schedules. We, we saw how busy they are. Some of them were actually doing two meetings at the same time. Hearings come up unannounced, meetings come up unannounced. So we really do appreciate 
them taking the time to talk to our, our members. And I wanna thank our members, our members, our volunteers, our activists. We heard references earlier to the red shirts that travel so often to Albany to make their voice heard, to have the 50 plus present at meetings and, and to move agenda items forward to improve the lives of the 50 plus. And we know how active they, are, they have been in Albany and in their communities. And we're trying to find ways to keep that activity going. Nobody speaks better for the 50 plus than the 50 plus. So I wanna thank our members, our activists, our volunteers, particularly those that are on today. You know, we have over 175,000 members in the districts of the people invited to participate today. So we are a strong, vibrant organization of the 50 plus representing them and their families and communities. And I will throw out, if you're not currently involved in our activities and wanna be more so, you can do that by going to ARP.org front, front slash get involved. These are really uncharted territories for everybody. And I, I learned a lot today. I hope you learned a lot today. It was a rich conversation covering a lot of areas. And we know how important these issues are and to many others that we did not get to today. So we hope to keep the conversation going. And we hope that the future is a bright one for everyone. We don't know what the future holds, but we know that uh, we need to stay on top of all the issues during the pandemic and be looking forward to the time after the pandemic and what those issues are that need to be addressed as well. So it was a robust conversation today. I hope everyone feels like they were more informed, um, uh, more dedicated to improving the lives of the 50 plus. And again, I just wanna thank everyone uh, and, and for participating, both watching, asking questions and answering questions. And I hope everyone has a great day. <clears throat>